Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, he is a data center uh, market outlook, uh, yeah, the head of EMEA Data Center Research for CBRE, and he's back, uh, and we're very happy to have him. Please make him feel welcome, Mr. Mitchell Patel. There we go. Yes. Hello everyone, hopefully this is better. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, listen, first and foremost, thanks Stein and the team um, at the Dutch Nation for putting together an amazing show today. Over a thousand participants is really an extraordinary effort. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys today just a little bit about how CBRE sees the European market outlook. Um, I'll run through the slides quite quickly because we've got a really interesting panel discussion afterwards. Just very quickly to introduce CBRE, um, we're the only global full service data center service provider. Um, not many people realize we manage over 800 data centers globally on behalf of cloud, co-location and enterprise clients. We are trying to grow our business in the region and we do have a stand um, just outside, so do come and visit our team. We've got a lot of our C-suite executives here today. So just a quick look at the agenda, just wanted to run through a couple of the sector drivers um, aware that there's a few people in the group who are just trying to get their heads around the data center sector and looking how they make their foray into the sector. We'll look at a little bit of a market analysis um, and then each year we kind of do some predictions. So we'll rank last year's predictions and, and have a look at how 2020 might look. So just to start, this has become quite a famous graphic in, in the sector now and it really does show just how much the industry is booming. Um, by 2025, in developed countries, humans will interact with a data center every 18 seconds of their life, which is quite extraordinary. Everything we do in the digital world, all these apps we use, goes through a data center. The great thing about this sector is, even though we're seeing so much growth today, we're at the tip of the iceberg. Things like artificial intelligence, driverless cars, virtual reality, gaming, all enabled by 5G and the age will really drive this sector onwards. So. Nobody should think that we've reached a peak. There's a lot way, long way to go in. We're very, uh, we're very positive about the prospects for the sector. And the amount of out outsourcing in the sector is increasing as well, which will hopefully interest most, most people in this room. Even though we've seen so much co-location activity in the last year, two years, there's still a long way to go. Today, 72% of data is still held on-premise. Tomorrow, we're taking a five-year barometer that will come down to 10%, with the majority, 60%, ending up in public cloud and roughly 30% in managed co-location. The great thing about the sector today is that public cloud is feeding so much of managed co-location. So we can no longer look at co-location as just retail and wholesale. We need to think about the effects of public cloud. So in effect, a large chunk of that 60% will end up in managed co-location, which I think is a huge opportunity for everybody in the room today. And just to look a little bit at some market analysis, um, this slide might not be so clear for everyone in the back, but we've listed the top 15 European co-location markets. That is a third party outsource market. CBRE have been tracking the top four or five markets in Europe for over 20 years now. So we've got a pretty good handle on how those markets look. And really two, three years ago, you're only talking about four or five markets in Europe. The flat markets of Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, and D for Dublin really were the five co-location hotspots, but now we're seeing a much wider spread. We're seeing places like Zurich, Milan, Stockholm, Warsaw start to see much more activity, again, all driven by public cloud. But people shouldn't see the industry as just focused on these four markets today. These next 10 cities, which two years ago wouldn't have even been considered co-location markets, are really starting to grow, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity in those cities. And the flip side of the co-location coin is the hyperscale self-build market. So you can see here the pink red arrows represent where a single hyperscale company 
has um, a self-built data center in a single city. Um, and you can see with the four green arrows being the, the biggest four European colo markets, there's quite a separation today between the four flat markets and the hyperscale self-built market. Dublin is really the only city that has a sustained strong co-location sector today and a huge um, hyperscale data center self-built market. But we're starting to see the barriers merge a little bit. Um, in the Netherlands, to the north of Amsterdam, in Agripor and Eemshaven, you do have hyperscale self-built data centers. And the hyperscale is very inquisitive about what they can do themselves in the big four markets as well. The challenge there for the co-location providers is now how can they ineffectively deal with the hyperscalers in a quasi self-built manner? How can they build partnerships with these companies so it's not pure landlord and tenant, but there's much more of a partnership? And we think that the way, that's the way the world is going in, in those markets. And so much of what we're seeing in the sector is just driven by the incredible development across the sector. Just some key highlights at the top there. Um, you know, the four flat markets grew by 25% in 2019, which is absolutely extraordinary. No asset class will have seen that much growth in just one year. Over 100 megawatts of new data center capacity was brought on in London in just Q4 2019. Dublin is seeing some extraordinarily huge schemes um, looking to, to be developed in that market. And really, all of this development is being built larger than ever just to capture the increased scale of the end user demand that we're seeing. If I can just draw your attention to the table on the left, which shows the five largest data centers um, in Europe. It's in, in effect the flat markets in 2019. Those five data centers alone um, equal just over 120 megawatts of capacity, of IT capacity. That would make them the fifth biggest co-location market in Europe. That's just five data centers in one year. So the increased scale of what we're seeing is absolutely enormous. Um, and developers are building those data centers to meet the increased double digit deployments that the hyperscalers are now taking. But all of that development does come with its challenges and companies are now finding it much more difficult to develop data center schemes than they ever have done before. Um, we're seeing power shortages and power constraints across major markets. You look at places like Schiphol in Amsterdam, the west of London towards Slough, and parts of Dublin as well. It's very difficult to reserve large amounts of HP power for your data center. People are starting to use alternative sources of power. We're seeing gas generation um, being used as a temporary measure, and, and companies like Agreco are benefiting massively from, from those types of solutions. And facilities are now being built with only a proportion of the overall power purchased, which a few years ago, would have been very risky to develop a 20, 30 megawatt data center and only have your first five, six megawatts of power purchased and reserved, but that's the way people have to play today. We're also seeing significant land constraints in prime data center hubs. So Slough in London, Sossenheim in Eschborn or in Frankfurt in places in, in Paris are becoming very constrained and getting data center planning and permitting on freehold land is becoming um, very difficult. In certain prime European markets, um, brownfield land with data center consent is now trading twice the amount of residential, which I think, again, two, three years ago would have, would have seemed impossible. The net effect of all of this is just the creation of new hubs and areas within key markets. So Frankfurt's a great example, for example, where Sossenheim and Eschborn are now um, extremely constrained. Places like Hanau and Offenbach are becoming new hubs for data center activity. So it's no longer the case that data centers are just clustered in small areas. People are having to move, move wider in major cities as well. And the third, which I think is quite important for people in the room, just a shortage of human capital and, and supply chain constraints as well. There is a real shortage of skilled labor in the data center industry. The fact that the four markets have grown 25% in, in the year means that there's enormous pressure on people to, to hire and retain um, their best staff. Demand for talent from the cloud providers is affecting talent retention and recruitment. Occasionally, one superstar goes the other way, but you know the sector is losing a lot of staff to, to the hyperscale companies who are looking to, to create their own teams to compete with the colos. And there are big construction bottlenecks as well in all the major markets. We're seeing significant, significant key lead, lead times for infrastructure teams, construction teams, and right across the supply chain, it's becoming much more difficult to, to get contractors quickly. 
And all of that development that we've just seen is just tantamount to the amount of take up we've seen in the sector over the last year or two. Um, the reason we use the word forecast and, and projections for 19 here, we're just collecting our final figures for 2019, so we'll have a, a full set for the year in the next few weeks. But 2019 may well be the record year for co-location take-up in Europe. We're expecting over 200 megawatts of capacity to have been procured across the four markets of Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris and Dublin as well in 2019. Frankfurt could become the first market in history to surpass 100 megawatts of co-location take-up in a single year. And it's really the first time in, in Europe we've seen the three hyperscale companies all looking for significant amounts of co-location capacity in the same city, in the same time. And the net effect of that means that Frankfurt has just exploded this year. Take-up from enterprise companies does still exist, but it's absolutely dwarfed by, by cloud take-up. Um, there is a slight typo in the bar chart on the left-hand side that should say flap take-up for 2015. So in 2015, just four years ago, the full take-up across the four markets was 64 megawatts. That 64 megawatts was split across 200 co-location transactions. In 2019, the five largest transactions have totaled 69 megawatts on their own. So again, you can just see the scale of growth. We've gone from 200 transactions to five to get to the same figure. And that is just the hyperscale companies now taking, so you can see double digits closing onto 20 megawatts in, in single transactions across Europe. And then the growth in take up has seen a large amount of M&A activity over the last um, year as it has in, in the year or two prior. So we just took four examples that we think are particularly strategic and I'll walk you through those quite quickly. So the final acquisition of the final 24% of Global Switch by, by another Chinese consortium um, means that Global Switch is now 100% Chinese owned. We've been talking for a couple of years about how the Chinese might navigate Europe, when they'll come to Europe, how big they'll go. And I think the full acquisition of, of Global Switch is a sign of intent as to their aspirations for Europe, and we're starting to see that demand trickle through now. GIC's JV with Equinix to fund their X-scale hyperscale platform was a really interesting one. So much competition to win hyperscale requirements these days, and hyperscale demand is, is such that GIC's lower cost of capital will, will enable Equinix to be more cost competitive and will enable them to serve the hyperscalers in a more cost-effective manner. We expect to see more of these transactions in Europe where large co-location providers will partner with infrastructure funds and other sources of capital um, to fund hyperscale developments. The DWS acquisition of the two Dutch platforms, NLDC and the data center group, um, was particularly interesting for us. We've seen Amsterdam as a Dutch hub for a while um, and secondary Dutch cities such as Rotterdam and, and Utrecht have not seen too much activity. But DWS's intention to create a real pan-national pan champion in the Netherlands is really interesting. And we expect to see similar models in places like Germany and, and France and the UK where these secondary cities will, will become much more interesting for, for end users. And then Digital Realty's announcement of their intention to, to acquire Interaction, which hasn't closed yet, I must add, um, but $8.4 billion, the largest co-location M&A transaction on record, and it will merge the largest global wholesaler with the biggest European retailer. And the signs that the two typical ways of servicing clients, wholesale and retail, are absolutely merging. Um, Digital Realty, should that acquisition close, will be able to offer a best of both worlds model to, to its clients in this new kind of converged world. And then just the final two slides, we'll just have a look at some of the predictions we made in 19, um, how we did, and um, we'll look forward to 2020. Um, we predicted last year we'd see strong take up, but it would be ultimately down on 18. Um, that hasn't come true. The, the year will probably end up at least on par, higher than 2018, most likely. Um, so we got that wrong. We didn't expect the amount of uh, the amount of double-digit transactions that we saw in, in the flat markets last year. We thought we'd see some established Western providers moving into Africa for the first time. And that started to happen. You know, East Shelter have publicly announced they're going into Johannesburg. Interaction have publicly announced their acquisition of a proportion of iColo. And we're starting to see more, more Western, traditional Western providers looking at Africa now. We thought we'd see more significant pan-European moves from developers. And we've seen that. There's record development. 
Um, decisions have been made and site searches are underway for, for a number of European companies looking to move into, into new jurisdictions. And some examples last year, Digital Realty moving back into Paris, Echelon making a move into, into the major European markets as a new colo company um, purchasing a, a property in London, and QTS moving over from the States to, to acquire two data centers in Groningen to, to mark their entry into Europe. We thought we'd see some hybrid IT um, activity driving banking sale and leaseback opportunities, um, and we've started to see that. There are multiple discussions underway today where banks and other enterprises are, are looking at what they might do with their self-build um, data centers. So just finally, looking forward to 2020, um, we think we'll see many more build to suit and single let co-location transactions will become much more commonplace in, in FLAP in Dublin this year. We started to see those last year, but we think they'll become commonplace. We think we'll see the first 10 megawatt plus hyperscale commitments outside of Flap D, and certainly the hyperscalers are very hungry for capacity outside of the major markets. We think we'll see the next wave of US developers moving into Europe. So we had a wave two or three years ago with, with four or five US companies, and we think there are two or three or four ready to, to push the button on Europe today, and some announcements we've made this year. And we think we might see reduced m a due to consolidation and significant recent activity. There is still huge opportunity for m a in Europe. It's going to be very competitive, and investors will have to be incisive, and they'll have to really know what they want to do to, to compete for these opportunities. But they, they do exist. We just think the volume will be down on last year. So that's all for me. 